you really like that tandem as well. As yes, sir. Just a few days after our last episode, we promised that we wouldn't record until after Christmas, unless there was something that, I guess, happens between those last couple of days. And here we are, the Toronto Blue Jays officially now, as it's about a couple hours ago, officially acquiring outfielder slash catcher Dalton Varsho from the Arizona Diamondbacks in exchange for Lourdes Gurriel Jr. and uh, prospect Gabriel Moreno. Welcome to Section 138, Episode 245. Here we are. Uh, I will be your host for this episode, Bryson Poza. Join alongside uh, Jacob. Unfortunately, our usual host, Mark, was unable to join us for this episode. So this is a an emergency podcast where we have a lot to talk about, of course, in this massive trade. Because let's be real, this is another huge trade for this franchise as this outfield continues to kind of go through a little bit of a transition from what we saw last uh, or at the end of last season. So, Jacob, I'll start things off with or how you how you are and your initial reaction to this trade. Well, considering 28 hours ago, because our, our last episode was just under two days. Uh, or, yeah, it was not, only a couple of days. Yeah, it barely posted. Yesterday when we recorded, I said, I don't think that we're going to have any type of big move before the end of 2022 or any big move during the beginning of 2023. I'm eating my words. I I'm shocked. I mean, I think the best way I can describe it. And I've said this to everybody that I've talked to you guys uh, and other people, it's a massive, massive return for the blue Jays, but it's a massive price for them as well. And it, it before I, or not to get too in depth into it, just in the intro, but it two teams that had what each other needed locked, uh, locked up the, it ended up working. And I think it's fair to say that at least from a blue Jay perspective, this is a good trade. There's been a lot of, I would say, mixed reactions from what I've seen so far in social media. A lot of people really like the move. I think we are, in major, or at least for the podcast, in terms of us three, including Mark, I think most of us have warmed up to it a little bit more since it was initially reported. And then I think there's a lot of people that are also kind of upset with this trade. So the fact of the matter is this has been a topic of conversation now for almost a year now in terms of this catching situation. Mark and both you and Mark uh, brought it up in the summer, Jacob, in terms of when this was going to happen. We knew it was inevitable. We knew that coming into the offseason, it felt like it was inevitable based off of what we've heard. And it's finally uh, been the case. And for the Toronto Blue Jays, obviously, the hole that they were looking to fill in for the outfield, of course, after trading Teoscar Hernandez and still a need that they needed was bringing in a left-handed at bat. But not only do you bring in a left-handed at bat, you bring in a guy who is very good defensively. I believe a DRS over 19 or it was 18 or 19 last season. There's a lot of comparisons that I'm seeing about a kind of a left-handed Matt Chapman who can play the outfield. And in that case, that is very good defensively, of course. And just, you look at where this outfield ended last year. You look at it now in terms of uh, Dalton Varsho, Kevin Kiermaier, and George Springer. All of a sudden, George Springer is arguably your third best defensive outfielder now. And really, we joked about the notion of run prevention, run prevention or on our last episode a couple of days ago. And you see that the Jays are actually pretty much going in that direction in terms of run prevention. Once again, this outfield has transitioned to a run prevention type of outfield compared to what we've seen with guys like Teoscar Hernandez and Lourdes Curio Jr. who have struggled uh, in the outfield at times. But you look at this trade even bigger or even in, in a bigger sense. And I think, you know, this is another player in Lourdes Curio Jr. Of course, and we all love Lourdes Curio Jr. He is going to be missed of course, of what he did, but this is another kind of fan favorite here. Another just guy that seemed very connected to this clubhouse and this is another trade that the the Jays make to, you know, go in a different direction and finally make that move that we were all talking about in terms of a left, left-handed left at-bat. So I'll ask you if Dalton Varsha was the one that was on the top of your radar. And second of all, just seeing where the outfield stands currently from what we saw uh, at the end of last season, what do you think or where do you think this outfield currently stands now? In terms of him being on my radar, I think it's fair to say he was on nobody's radar. I mean... Actually, just before so the news dropped, I think it was what was like 4.30 or something. So Tim and Friends was was on just after that. And I think it was Tim McAuliffe, one of the two hosts, that said October 13th, like right after the Blue Jays were eliminated, they started mentioning outfielders, and he was one of them. I don't think I ended up watching that episode because I don't remember that happening, but this was on some people's radar, but it definitely wasn't on my radar. And I think it's... I. 
when I say it's a good return for the Blue Jays, Dalton Varsho is going to make this outfield a lot better. You mentioned the obviously the ability to play in the outfield, but I think what's what's also is he can play catcher. Now I'm not saying he's going to be their backup catcher by any means, but what if you need to pinch hit for Kirk or pinch run for Kirk, but Jansen's the one that's catching that game or or whatever it is. You can put him there, move Merrifield or Biggio or whatever. Like you have a little bit more flexibility, but in terms of where the outfield actually stands, I think run prevention, it's clear that run prevention is going to be a good thing. I mean, if you have, when you look at it, the Blue Jays right now have three center fielders spread out throughout their outfield. You know, Kevin Kiermaier, obviously amazing gold glove capabilities. George Springer made a lot of great catches last season. Dalton Varsho, same thing, gold glove finalist many times throughout his career. He is somebody that is going to provide you with that elite defense. And I've been watching a lot of, you know, old game clips from realistically the last three to four seasons, you know, the Guriel, the Hernandez, uh, Grichik ish era of, of the outfield. There are a lot of plays where you look at them and those are plays that should have been made, whether it was just a, a misplay, a missed catch, even go back to something like the home opener where Guriel tried to gun someone down at home. The ball went out. I don't think it ended up hitting the mesh, but Danny Jansen had to catch it. And look, as much as I liked both Guriel and Hernandez, I think this is a bit of an upgrade in terms of what the Blue Jays do need. Like they get a guy who hits from the left, who hits home runs, even like the average, it's not necessarily going to blow anybody away. I mean, you look at it, 302 on base percentage last season, 235 average. You're probably thinking, well, Guriel hit 291. Like, why is that? Why is that considered an upgrade? Well, when he's hitting 27 home runs and he's potentially saving a lot of a lot of runs from the other team, especially now with the shift being banned, I think this is a, a benefit. And I think it was you, so I'll give you credit. You you posted a, a tweet to us saying that his WAR, Dalton Varsho, I think it was 4.9 last season. So you know more than what it would have Guriel... led the team last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and you said it was more than what Guriel and Hernandez were combined. So it's a tough price to pay. I know we haven't even really mentioned the, the other player in this name. I don't think anybody of us, any of us, have said it yet. But Gabriel Moreno, that's obviously a big price to pay. And then you throw in Guriel, but. I think it, considering that Guriel is a free agent at the end of next season and Varsho's not a free agent until 2027, if you're in win-now mode, I think this guy helps you win now. And that's the thing. Um, you look at a 27-year-old at-bat, of course, in Dalton Varsho, and of course, under team control, like you mentioned, in 2027. There's a lot of factors here where you look at it. And, you know, I don't think it's – I think it's pretty obvious, you know, or when you look at it, or it is pretty noteworthy that, yes, I think this price was uh, steep. But at the same time, it was something that this team had to do. It was something that I understand why they did. And it's been something that we've been talking about for so long in terms of they them finally – replacing or just adding that left-handed at bat, you know, and Mark's been using the word all off season in terms of diversifying the lineup. And this is something that they're doing with that. And of course, more importantly, the run prevention idea that you're doing, you're bringing this in, you have now a, an elite uh, outfield in terms of how this thing is really transitioned. It's definitely a little bit odd though, for a team coming off of 90 wins to really kind of go through this, you know, a little bit of um, turnover, a little bit, I wouldn't say a completely or a complete whole lot, but a little bit of turnover now, but essentially your outfield is better. Um, of course, defensively, it is for sure. And offensively, you're still working at, you know, the whole idea of this, or I guess coming into this trade was just replacing the value of Teo Oscar Hernandez offensively. And I do think that while it may not be completely filled just yet, because I still think there's moves on the way, it was definitely a good, uh, it was a good move for them to move in the right direction to do this because of course, uh, Dalton Varsho definitely c- can hit as much as he's really good defensively. And another, I guess, noteworthy thing is that he's going over from Chase Field, which is a relatively pitchers friendly ballpark all the way to Rogers Center. And you feel like he's going to be more comfortable there. Of course, you mentioned different aspects about the shift being, you know, a lot or just the shift not existing and helping a left-handed at bat. And of course he's probably, or he is in a deeper lineup with the Jays. So he's going to be way more protected in this lineup. And, that's why, you know, when you evaluate everything and you understand that, yes, the, the price was high, it just it, it makes complete sense and total sense for the Jays to do this. And I asked you about in terms of the uh, being on or Dalton Varsho being on the Blue Jays radar, because, of course, while some may have had that predicted earlier on in the offseason, I think the main guy that a lot of us were focusing on, especially us on this podcast, was the idea or the rumors of Brian Reynolds coming over now. And that obviously at this point is probably most likely, but 
not dead in the water, of course, now that the Jays got their guy. But that was the guy that I think we've been focused on so much the past couple of weeks every year after hearing about the rumors at the winter meetings that he requested a trade and that the Jays were among teams that were looking at him on that. And, you know, originally what we heard as well was that the price was very steep for what the Pirates were asking for. But you have to imagine this trade is going to make his value go even more through the roof when it does get done or if it does get done uh, at the end of the day. So while we focus on Dal- Dalton Varsho, and you mentioned it a little bit here at the end before you threw back over to me. Let's get into that now in terms of Gabriel Moreno being, of course, one of the main pieces going back. Once again, a topic of conversation that we've had uh, pretty much going on for almost a year now. It's officially over at this point. And for me, I've it, it, to me, it got a little bit annoying because of the amount of talk that there was with this. And I remember saying about a month ago on uh, one of the episodes is that when it came down to who the Jays were going to move, At the end of the day, no matter who it was, I was going to be at peace with it because I trusted the front office to make a move where they did think that this was going to to benefit them or not. So I'll throw throw it back to you now. Are you happy it was Gabriel Moreno? And if not, who were you expecting more or uh, who who are you? Who else were you expecting other than Moreno who would have had a higher likelihood of getting traded, which would have been maybe Kirk or Jansen? I'm going to be honest. I 1000 percent would have preferred this trade to be Gabriel Moreno as part of it. And here's the thing. I know people are expecting him to be the next Salvador Perez, Buster Posey, whatever you want to call him, call him the next great catcher. I hope that would be the case. I hope that if he was still in the Blue Jays system, that would be the case. But realistically, I I don't know if I said this yesterday on the episode or not, but I've said this basically like to just people throughout uh, just talking and whatever. But I had said that, you know what you can get out of Danny Jansen and, uh, and, Alejandro Kirk like they've shown what they can do at the major league level I think that it's safe to say that their return is a little bit more capped than if you were to trade Moreno and part of that is because of the unprovenness and the the buying into the hype and you know I've heard people say that well why don't you get somebody else like there could have been better options for you well I don't really think that's true I mean I think that Brian Reynolds would have had a much higher price you know probably a a starter or something at least and I don't really think the Blue Jays are in the market to trade a, a starter but with Gabriel Moreno, it was interesting. So Mike Wilner tweeted right after or within the first 10, 15 minutes of it. And this is a tweet that I've kind of resonated with and learned to live with since the Barrios trade and just trades in general involving high prospects. It's a, where he says, basically, the truth is that most prospects, even the really good ones, never wind up being as good as the established MLBers that they get traded for. And maybe people disagree with that. You know, maybe people say that this prospect ends up being really good. I think it's fair to say that just because somebody is rated extremely highly doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be really good. And I think if you're, if you're the blue Jays, I think this is a trade that you can live with. It's not like you're going to say, darn in two years or three years time, we could have missed out on the best catcher in the entire league. Well, the catching duo that you have right now, it is honestly, it's quite good. Like when you have a situation where you have an elite defensive catcher and then another catcher that you have, essentially no choice but to throw him into your lineup because he's so good at hitting. I don't really see an issue with that. And I I think that it makes more sense if you're in win now mode, you win now with the guys that have proven they can win now. And I know Moreno's average was up over 300 this past season, but he played in like 21 games. So it's not really fair to say that it would have continued that way. Could have been better. Could have been worse. I mean, would have been worse. Definitely. Like when you play that small of a sample size, but I think that this trade makes sense for them. Knowing that you're in win now mode, you get an outfielder that's going to help you win now and win now for the next couple seasons, next four seasons, if all goes to plan. You keep your your catching duo. Yeah, the price might be a little bit high when you also consider that Lourdes Gurriel Jr. is added to it, but I think if you're in win now mode, this helps you win now. And I said that in the last segment. This helps you win now, this acquisition. And I know a lot of people are probably going to disagree with us and we got a lot of hate for saying that Moreno was probably going to be the one traded back in August or whenever it was but I don't think the Blue Jays are in the market right now to say let's wait on this catcher let's see what we can get out of him especially when you know you have a good catching duo so I'm interested to see what you what you think and I'm interested to hear what the people in the comments and and just all throughout social media are going to say because I think this is going to be one of the more divisive moves that Atkins has made in the last couple of off seasons. Yeah. I mean, once again, it it got to the point for me that uh, of how much we spoke about it, that no matter what or who was traded out of the three, 
I was going to be fine with, and I'll stick by that. The only worry I have with the prospect in Gabriel Moreno is having, you know, I guess just in the back of my head, is that he's going to pan out to be what they say he's going to be. And it's going to be, I, it would be tough to watch in terms of him doing that in Arizona. But at the same time, once again, we know who Varsho is in terms of the return that's coming over to the Jays side. And what remains now is Danny Jansen and Alejandro Kirk. And we, we've talked about it so much. And we brought it up a little bit about Danny Jansen potentially being that guy that was traded. And then it always came back to the fact of how respected he was in this organization. And we knew that for a fact in terms of how likable he was again and how comfortable he was with this pitching staff. And for me, as much as I didn't care uh, of which one of the three was going to get moved, it always it was always for me the most like or the least likely it was going to be Jansen. So for me, it was more of under the expectation that it was going to be Alejandro Kirk or Gabriel Moreno. And then at the same time, we know the season that Alejandro Kirk had last year, an all-star breakout season. He was catching as much as he, or pretty much the most he, he's ever had, as much as he had some restraints on him. Uh, I believe, from what I remember, it was no more than three times a week he was catching. And um, they really had a, or he really stepped up as well, especially with Danny Jansen missing as much time as he did. And uh, Gabriel Moreno being up and down from Buffalo. So he really held the ground at the catch position last year of course and you know everyone's gonna make or he definitely you know defensively he he has some strengths and of course there's some stuff he has to work on but he really proved himself to be that reliable catcher in my opinion last year and of course again being an all-star and leading the way especially in the first half he kind of cooled off a little bit in the second half of the season or closer to the end of the season but he still had a really uh, or had a couple of good hot streaks in that span as well so I'm comfortable with it I'm comfortable with Danny Jansen. We know that he had such an underrated season where he was leading the team basically in OPS the entire year as much as he was off or off and on the injured list. And it was just some freak injuries or freak accidents where it was kind of unfortunate, especially at the beginning of the season last year when he, I think it was his finger that he broke and he had to miss already about four weeks right away. And he had such a good opening weekend against the Rangers in that series. And I believe that's the game we were at together was when he did break his finger and, or he, he did suffer that injury and had to miss an extended period of time. So under the assumption that both Jansen and Kirk can stay healthy for a majority of the season, you really like that tandem as well, as much as Gabriel Moreno had to move on. You still have two really good catchers who have proven themselves already at the major league level. Something with all due respect, Gabriel Moreno has not done. Of course, a lot of the reason was maybe a limit in playing time and maybe, you know, just being the odd man out because of the fact that Jansen and Kirk was here. So that's always the gamble you're going to take on prospects. It's unknown how good he's going to be. He has a lot of potential. We talked about how excited the organization was for him, and even we were for him on that one. So he's going to have a chance to prove himself in Arizona and play every day. And now, as well, a key member of the clubhouse in terms of Lourdes Scurriel Jr., just like Teoscar Hernandez, are now gone. So when you look at the outfield, of course, again, you have Dalton Varsho in left field, Kevin Kiermaier in center field, George Springer in right field. And then, of course, uh, looking at, I guess, as of now, according to Fangraphs, your projected starting lineup, uh, it goes along the lines of George Springer, Bo Bichette, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Alejandro Kirk, Matt Chapman, Dalton Varsho, Danny Jansen, Whit Merrifield, and Kevin Kiermaier. So that's obviously subject to change, but that's a decent idea of where things stand right now. Another, you know, you you, you identify the positions that are filled now with this outfield and, of course, within the rest of the lineup as well. I'll ask you, as the offseason continues to approach, what else do you think the Jays need to do uh, in terms of offseason moves, of course? After I mentioned basically the starting nine or the projected starting nine now, where do you think there's some weaknesses now and where do you think they can improve on uh, before opening day or before spring training approaches? So the funny thing is, is I still think the outfield is the weak point of, of the, de- not the defense, but the weak point if you wanted to can compare that aspect of your lineup i think part of that is just because they ended up trading guriel and say you trade i don't know maryfield or espinal like you, you trade somebody else because we know that guriel was essentially the the just the throw in give that extra bit of of service time get get him playing next season i still think that they well i don't know because maryfield is i could see him probably playing more in the outfield or maybe more in the infield it depends on what they want to do i mean I think he'll play more than Espinal, at least out of the gate. But, well, if he does that, then he's going to be in the infield. But I think that most likely they're going to need to go out and still get a fourth outfielder because, like, no disrespect to Kevin Kiermaier, but we said this the last like, episode or even the last two episodes. I don't necessarily know that he's an outfielder on a World Series team right now. I still think you need to go out and get somebody. And 
the problem is, is you're not now going to go out and get Brian Reynolds or somebody else. Like if, if they were somehow able to keep Guriel, I think that off season might be done. You just go out and get some bullpen arms, maybe pitcher here and there. But in terms of the rest of the off season, I, I, I still think they're going to go out and get pitchers. Absolutely. We've seen this all throughout. I mean, well, like all the time they go out and get pitchers just leading up to spring training, older guys, minor league deals, blah, 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 all that type of stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if there are some more Kevin Kiermeyer type signings, not obviously as much, but like one year deals. If you make the team out of spring training, you do, but if you don't, then you get released. And I think there's, th- that's what they'll probably do. They'll look for that fourth outfielder and just at this point, look for depth because I think they've made enough big moves that realistically, you're not going to go out and get somebody to be Kevin Kiermeyer's replacement or else you wouldn't have gone out and signed him. So I know I said this a mere 30 hours ago, but I do think that now, now they're probably done for the rest of 2022, probably early 2023. So at this point, I think it is just depth. I thought it was just depth as of yesterday. So I, I my opinion really hasn't changed much. I, I just, I don't know what else that they necessarily could do in terms of big moves. Cause they just made the Bassett deal, the, the, obviously this trade, the Kiermaier trade or the Kiermaier acquisition at, at this point, I don't really know what else they can do. Yeah, um, I think, well, first of all, I, I remember you pretty much saying this uh, last episode that this was something that they had to pivot on right now. And then, of course, we brought up the idea that potentially another starting pitcher that is still out there, a fifth starter that the Jays can definitely still pivot to and possibly look into getting. And at the same time, where you have Dalton Varsho in the outfield now, it definitely is in need of another move in, a, in terms of another fourth outfield. The only thing that is interesting to me now is it doesn't necessarily have to have the label of this guy has to be a lefty because you have that now of our show. This can be somebody who's a righty. It could be a switch hitter and it there's lots of, and when you open that spectrum, just away from just lefties, there are a ton of names that are still out there that could potentially now be good fits on this team. You know, I I think there's a lot of buzz right now on blue Jays, Twitter um, surrounding a Robbie Grossman type of player. And of course he's a switch hitter. He's available. There was rumors a couple days ago, but now when you look at it now, it does make more sense, of course. I mean, now the Dalton Var shows here, but you know, I'm not saying it's going to be Robbie Grossman, but there's types of players like him along the lines of him that could really benefit this lineup now as a fourth outfielder, and of course, who can platoon or pretty much be mixed in the lineup every day. And really, as you look at it now, um, I think in terms of the remaining the remaining bench pieces, of course, assuming that you go out and get a fourth outfielder, you, you know, to me, the position that really has a lot of platooning in it would be second base still. And I mean, you have Whit Merrifield hanging around that you've mentioned. Uh, Santiago Espinal is going to get a lot of at-bats as well. Kevin Biggio is around. So those are guys that are going to be hovering around platooning at second base. And of course, potentially the outfield the odd time. And we're under the assumption that they're going to still go out and get one more bat for the outfield. If that's the case, this both trades now in terms of uh, getting uh, Eric Swanson and, of course, getting Dalton Varsho and the Teoscar Hernandez and Lourdes Gabriel Jr. trades look a lot better uh, in terms of what you're replacing and how you're replacing that value. The fifth starter is still a question I'll throw back at you if you do think that's something that they do go out and get. And, of course, you can never get any more relievers than you do now. So I think that the bullpen as well is still something that potentially is in the back of their mind of uh, something they can do. So that's something that I look forward to, of course, as the calendar year of 2022 comes to a close, Jacob, of course you were wrongly, or you were very wrong about that in terms of that being the final move or just no more moves until the calendar flipped over to 2023. So in conclusion, you look at this now, we know how we, what the off season has been. A lot of people, once again, aren't exactly the happiest to say, but you know, I mentioned it a a little bit ago and you do look at it now again for a team who won 90 games last year or over 90 games last year. This is a decent turnover that you have in the outfield now, because you usually don't see this for a team who is at the cusp of of where they are right now. Of course you can make the argument. They're going to be a better team next year. I think a lot of people do believe that. And of course, defensively, there's no question right now that they are a much better team. Their bullpen's a lot better. The starting rotation's looking really good. And of course, again, if Dalton Varsho can continue to hit uh, relatively to what he's been doing in Arizona, maybe a little bit better at Rogers center, you really like where things stand. So to close this off now, Teoscar Hernandez, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., both guys uh, that we actually haven't really mentioned yet, of course, in terms of their contract, who have one more year left until they're free agents, which would be at the end of the 2023 season. You know, 
I've seen this narrative being thrown around. I've brought it up. Uh, I think I brought it up one time with Teoscar Hernandez. A lot of people don't necessarily think, or a lot of people do necessarily think it's stupid, but I have to ask you because of this. Of course, you know, this kind of ties in as well with bringing in Don Mattingly. I don't know if this is some sort of factor or if this is strictly about contract and, you know, just being expendable pieces, but these are two guys now in terms of two key clubhouse members that are now gone. Do you think that, you know, I know we've, and of course there's been tons of talk about it. Maybe again, maybe it is dumb. Maybe it's not. I'll ask you in terms of, you know, having too much fun in the dugout or not. Do you think there's any connection to that? Or do you think this is strictly one year left for Gurriel, one year left for Hernandez? Of course the Jays have needs to fill it in with the lefty at bat. That's only what it was. Or do you think it goes a little bit more beyond that uh, of what I mentioned in terms of the clubhouse antics or anything like that? Maybe this is me just not wanting to buy it, but when you're winning 90 plus games for two seasons in a row and on pace for nearly 90 wins the season before in 2020, you can have as much fun as you want. And they won 92 games or whatever, 91 games in 2021 in three different ballparks. So I really hope that's not the case. I don't think it really is. I, I feel like Don Mattingly is not like the stereotypical old guy that'd be like, oh, no fun, blah, blah, blah. Like throw away the seeds and I'll bench you. Like, I really don't think that that's the case. I think he would be genuinely willing to work with them, but I I think it is more about, you know, the contracts and what say both of them, Guriel and Hernandez were still on the roster. I don't think one of them, or I don't think both of them come back next season. I think one of them's gone. I'm surprised they traded both of them. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if they them trading one of them this off season, but yeah, I, I think that was more of what it is. Like they're not going to resign both of them and, with the way that major league baseball has been going these last couple seasons, do you really think that either one of them get like a eight, nine year contract? Or I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure, but oh, I'm not saying they would, but you know what I mean? Like we've kind of seen that weird thing where good players get like ridiculously large contracts. And I don't necessarily think that they'd be willing to dish that out. That's all I really think it is. I don't think that it's necessarily like, yeah, the culture is going to shift a little bit, but I don't think that that's, I don't think that's the driving factor in this move. I think it is strictly, you got to win now. These guys are not going to necessarily be here or not guaranteed to be here. And so let's, let's make some changes. Yeah. I mean, it could be a dumb comparison, but there's been talk about it. Maybe it's not that affected at all, but the fact of the matter is yes, these are moves that the Jays have now made and like it or not, or even if it is about those antics or not, the clubhouse will definitely have a different feel uh, by when spring training occurs. And this team definitely still has moves to make. But uh, at the same time, they're making those moves and they still have a couple more to go. The outfield now is elite defensively. Dalton Varsho is officially a Toronto Blue Jay and Lourdes Gurriel Jr. is out as long or as well as Gabriel Moreno. So we can officially finally put to rest the catching debate of which one is going to be traded. It's something that I think I'm looking forward to. And I'm sure you are as well, that we can finally move on from that now. And I think, I think that will wrap things up there. Of course, if there's any other sort of crazy move, but as Jacob said, I highly doubt that's going to be the case. That might be seeing you tomorrow. We'll never know. I mean, exactly. On Christmas Eve, you never know. But yes, I think that will wrap things up there, of course, for the final episode, most likely from us for the rest of the 2022 calendar. Thank you so much for or thank you all for listening, of course, throughout the years again or throughout the year. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast or podcasts. You can find us on YouTube. And of course, you can find us on Patreon at Section 138 uh, pod. Um, Jacob, again, we can wish the fall or the wish the listeners a happy holidays. Once again, we can do that again. We will chat in some or at some point in the new year. And of course, Mark will likely be back with this as well. And we will catch you then. 